Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship on this foggy Sunday morning. It's good that Christ lights our way, isn't it? When we can only see about a what, 100 meters in front of us. But we give thanks to God that we are gathered here today in person and through our streaming means. And with that in mind, I just want to give a little bit of an update. I'll be sending out a letter this week too. Just the reality we are in COVID right now. And I want to just encourage you to come to worship as you are comfortable, whether it's in person. We will be continuing in-person um, worship throughout this, um, this surge that we are in because we know that those who are more comfortable or who are experiencing symptoms can worship either on Zoom, on Facebook, or on YouTube. So we have options here, and that's a blessing that we have, that people can select where they are comfortable on their own as far as um, worshiping as our community. And we know we are a community in Christ, <laughs> that God connects even when it needs to be virtually at times. One thing we are going to shift a little bit because of our current surge right now is we were going to start choir this week, and we are going to delay at least two weeks and kind of monitor to see when that viral spread in the community kind of peaks and starts coming down and then restart. We are so excited with Nancy to get going on that, but we also want to make sure that our restart into choir is something that we are comfortable with and it's a, a good timing for that. So keep in mind, those of you who are singers and have maybe um, not thought about being in a choir for maybe it's been four decades, I don't know, that there will be something, um, an opportunity for that starting soon as well. We'll continue to have communion up here in front. We will continue to do other things, but we just, I want to encourage you, as we see a lot of our people that are normally here, I know are worshiping at home. So the other thing um, with that is we're following the CDC guidelines as far as isolation and quarantine, quarantine and isolation if you are a close contact. Um, so follow, it's on our website if you want to look at the whole details. One thing we would say that is if you are serving communion or having an active role in worship, then we would definitely ask for that. Call, talk to me and we'll talk about if it's a five day or a 10 day isolation period upon positive tests. That's something we will, depending on your role in the community, that changes. If you are a close contact, um, follow those, those CDC guidelines also on our website of what is appropriate. So it's five days right now. Um, if you're a positive, if you're positive, and then you're welcome to return with a mask on, which we're all wearing masks in the state, so we don't have to worry about whether we're masking or not, because that's part of our current mandate. If that's confusing, it's because it is. <laughs> we are in a time where it is hard, but we are committed here at Creator that we have options and we will be safe, but also we need to be together. So, thank you for that understanding. Questions are welcome and we will do this together. Other, um, Monday is Martin Luther King holiday, so our office will be closed on Monday. Um, today, after the second service, the ministry team leaders and the council are meeting to have um, kind of a assessing of what we need now and how we can support one another, so excited, pray for that. Um, our annual congregation meeting will be January 30th between services, and that's a celebration for us of what we have done together and what God has done in and through us um, as a congregation. Between services today will be the second of three classes on ragged spiritual disciplines for the spiritually exhausted. Um, I do believe that if you didn't come first time and you're interested in coming, you're welcome to come. I don't think you will feel like you're left behind or missed something super important. This was a good discussion last week. I believe those are our main announcements. So please rise for our greeting. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God's people be, God's peace be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God.
We gather this morning in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life, and above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. And before we have our prayer of the day, as a remembrance of our baptism as well, it's applying that baptism to you all and remembering what you receive in this. You are heirs and children, but you also receive the forgiveness of your sins. So as a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by Christ's authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you anointed Jesus at his baptism with the Holy Spirit and revealed him as your beloved Son. Keep all who are born of water and the Spirit faithfully in your service, that we may rejoice being called children of God through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Isaiah, the 43rd chapter. But now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, And from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not withhold. Bring my souls, bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'll invite the child who's here with us in person, who happens to belong to me, to come forward. Well, today is actually, well, it was last week, but I'm I'm the pastor, and so I can change things a little bit. We're celebrating the baptism of our Lord, baptism of Jesus Sunday today. Last week, we had Epiphany Sunday, which the Magi, the kings, came to visit Jesus. And it was the first time we saw that the whole world 
was going to be changed by the fact that Jesus came. So now, with the baptism of our Lord, we learn about baptism a little bit and how Jesus was baptized, and we can remember our baptism story. So any of you at home as well, share your baptism stories with one another or a memorable baptism that you have. Or get out that baptismal candle and remember today that you are baptized and that promise that you have in Christ. Sometimes it's fun to, if you're, um, your children, to tell them how their baptize, baptism went. Who was there? What happened? Did they cry a lot? Did they not cry at all? Those are fun things to hear. So when we get home today, we'll tell you and Abigail about your baptism stories. But also in our text, I don't know if you heard what Dan said, there was this phrase in it that says, you are mine. And I know right after Christmas, a lot of times we become very territorial about our toys. I don't know if you have realized that, but like, whose are these? They're yours, mine. They were your dad's, right? He had them, um, he bought them when he was about 30, by the way. And so, most of them he had still in the packaging because he bought them when they were, they were reissued and he left them in a box because he was excited to have them. Every time he went to Target and buy them, He'd be like, mine, 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 mine. And he wanted them. And then as you got older, did he really want to share them that much? Was it kind of slow to get him to share them with you? Slowly he'd be like, okay, Joaquin, you can play with these two. And then what would you say? Can you have more? And then you're like, and then how about your sister? Was she kind of the same way? She'd be like, these are mine and those are yours. And we, you kind of fought over whose they belong to, right? And sometimes it could get, get a little contentious. Do you ever do that with books? Like even yesterday, I know you brought some books into the living room and what did Abigail say like immediately? Is this one yours? That one's mine. Are you sure it's yours? Why is it in your room? We like to have things that are ours, right? And sometimes that can make it... Um, we can fight over it, right? But c- come here, right here, in these waters, what God told you when you were baptized was that you were his. And that's a, really the best way to say you are mine. So God tells you and God tells all of us that you belong to Jesus. Even though you're my son, guess who you belong to even more than me? You belong to Jesus even more than you belong to me. You belong to God, and God loves you. So not kind of like the mine, 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 but he is telling you that nothing else matters as much as that. And other people or other things in the world might say, okay, you're mine, you're mine, come over here. Jesus is going to always go, nope, you're mine. No matter what, I will always forgive you. I will always love you. You will always be mine, Jesus says to you. Sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? Not selfish at all. When God says that, it's the opposite of selfish. It is God wrapping us in God's love and keeping us forever. So let us pray. Dear Jesus, we give thanks for baptism, that you claim us as your own, that we are yours. And when we start saying, mine, 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 help us to remember that we all belong to you and all that we have is because of you. And for that, we give thanks. And all God's children said, Amen. Please rise for a gospel reading. The gospel according to Luke, the third chapter. And I'm going to throw at Joe for a little bit of a curveball. I'm going to add a few verses in the middle, so just follow along as best as you can. There's some good verses in there that we, we forgot to include, or the lectionary forgot to include. So the, Luke, the third chapter, 15 through 22. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, But one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. 
But Herod the ruler, who had been rebuked by John because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the evil things that Herod had done, added to them all by shutting up John in prison. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. With the um, volcanic eruption this, that this weekend in Tongo and the threat of tsunamis that have reached even our shores, we realize, and we're probably, I actually looked on Google Maps of where in the world that island was and how many islands are out there in the world. A lot of our members have, have connections with Hawaii as well, so they spend many times on the islands. And I've always looked at islands as being separated by water, that they are little, little pieces of land that the water creates distancing. The water creates separation between these different little groups and people who live upon them. Recently, in a Bible study with some other pastors, a sermon was shared about, from a South Pacific Islander pastor who recently changed my view on that. He said that for the islanders, instead of seeing as the water separating them, they actually see the water as what connects them. Very different way to think about how we are in community with one another. What separates us? And what could actually those separations be? People who were not living life they they were in exile. They had had warnings from early on that if they kept in their ways, that they would reach judgment and struggle. And in fact, that happened as the Babylonians came in and took them into captivity for a whole generation. And now we see in Isaiah that promises are beginning to come to their ears again, rather than just, you better watch out, you better not do that or else. Now that they have the consequence of their actions, a new word is coming to them, that they'll be returned, that they'll be gathered, that they'll be restored not by their own force or effort, but by God, who they had not been faithful to. And nonetheless, God would respond in favor towards them, redeeming them, calling them by name. When you think about that, how intimate, how known is it when you are called by name? It's personal. You know that you are included. And as Isaiah says, God does this because we are precious, we are honored, we are loved. We are God's own, and God is with us. So layered on top of this promise, however, as always when anything is about to change, God or the prophets or the angels say, don't be afraid. And then they talk about water and rivers and fire, and you're just like, okay, what's the catch here? You say not to be afraid, and then you're telling me all these frightening things that are about to happen that I have no control over. They talk about not being overwhelmed, not be, that we won't be burned or consumed as these changes take place. But all of these scare- sayings tend to be frightening. If somebody tells you not to be overwhelmed, what's probably the first thing you're going to do? Feel overwhelmed. If somebody says, don't worry, this will be hard, but you will not be consumed, you will not be burned up, you'll be like, I don't know if I want to take the first step. Can it be done without all the danger? Can't we just skip the fire and the water? But the reality is life from death doesn't just happen. Return from exile isn't easy. 
moving through waters and fires and rivers of life is not usually something we take lightly or that we embark upon with ease. And to the fact of the matter, we're not even equipped to handle it. So layering onto that, we have our gospel, and we have the story of John the Baptist wrapping up here. It's echoes from Advent when we hear, and he, he tells us, one is coming, one is coming, one is coming. And there's a pivot in our text from, from Luke today where we go from John to Jesus like all the pivots we've been doing in these last two and a half years here. John's ministry has always been about preparing for Jesus and pointing to Jesus and also pointing out our sin. All the people who John had baptized were named as sinners, as somebody who needed and was probably overwhelmed and maybe being consumed by their sin, maybe enveloped by the conflict that they were creating or created in their midst. But John had moved it into another realm when he had encountered Herod. And as Luke just kind of runs on through, I want to just sit a moment with, because John had exposed all of the evil that Herod had done. And then Herod just adds to the situation by imprisoning and later beheading John. I mean, Herod was like a soap opera level, a telenovela level of evil and manipulations. He had married the wife of his brother, who was also his niece. And then when he was called upon it, he decided, I'm going to try to break free from this law on my conscience, and I'm going to just lock John away. Because if I can't see the person who's accusing me and naming my sin, then it will go away. Then I'll feel better. That never, ever works. Not for Herod and not for us. When our sin is named or when we name it in somebody else's face, every time they see us, what are they going to do? That's right. I remember what I did to that person. I better go the other direction in the grocery store. The law stays on our conscience. We can't just lock it up. We just can't behead it and make it go away. We cannot stop the accusation of the law. So John says that Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit and that his winnowing fork will clear the threshing floor and gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. What's it with all the fire today? What's it with all the destruction? What's it with all this, once again, separation between what serves and what doesn't? what is, unites us and what pulls us apart, what is good and what is bad. And yet we hear that this action of Christ is good news. It's good news because we are the wheat because of Christ. What has separated us in Christ has now come together in God. We are so worried when we talk about separation, about judgment, we fear of, about being overwhelmed. We fear living, about living the consequences of my sin and my neighbor's actions. Right now, look at our congregation again. It was like going, you know, but more and more people here, and now, once again, we're separated again. Things out of our control, and yet we are feeling the results of that separation. So often we wonder, and in the Old Testament especially, what comes out is that we don't know how God is reacting. We don't know whether we are the wheat or the chaff. We worry about that wrath of God. And when God is not preached, we will continue to worry whether God is for me or against me, whether God loves me or not. Does God? Does God know us? Even with our masks on? Even shut behind our doors? Can God really get to know us on Zoom? I don't know. Like Luke, we need to pivot, or better said, be pivoted to Jesus. From John to Jesus, from judgment and pointing out of sin to the one thing that Jesus has come to bring. 
and even more remarkably to this full moment of epiphany that is just encapsulated in a few verses of Luke today, that Jesus was baptized, and then Jesus prayed. Only in Luke, of all the baptismal counts, does it say that Jesus was praying, which is a lovely focus because what is prayer after all? Prayer is communicating with God. Prayer is conversing and connecting with God when we do it and also when Jesus does it. So when Jesus does it and Jesus is God's own son, what happens? The heavens opened that morning. And when the heavens opened, nothing, 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 nothing separated the father and the son that morning or that afternoon or whatever time of day that baptism was. That's remarkable. God, Christ in his divine presence, God the Father in heaven is there, and the Holy Spirit makes an appearance as well, not as fire, thank goodness, like in Pentecost, but as a dove, as peace. So we see in this text today the full glory of God, God fully revealed. And it's not a God of wrath or fear or consuming us, it's a God of peace and mercy come before us fully present. God fully knows us, each and every one of us. And Jesus became incarnate for a reason. With the Magi, we know it wasn't only for Israel, but for all nations. He came to die, and in being baptized, we are also showed why and how Jesus, Jesus would save us. He was baptized because after all, who needs to be baptized? Sinners. Wait a second, Jesus isn't a sinner. How does that work? Well, what happens in the moment of his baptism, Jesus begins his work of taking on the sin of the world, taking it from you, from all of us, and taking it as his own. So a hidden offense that the gospel text gives us today is actually that there's no longer separation when the heavens open between the Father and the Son, between heaven and Christ. But there's also nothing separating God from our sin. There's nothing separating God from our broken world. God is revealed in this epiphany to not be wrath but mercy overcoming that separation between us and our creator and taking on our sin and freeing us. And freeing us because we are God's own and we are loved. Only God could take that separation and do something with it that would bring us life. So remember those islands separated by all that water that's now reaching our shores? <laughs> we are separated from one another by tides of envy and judgment. The waves of regret continue to crash on our shores. The stumbling waves of competition, the undertow of competition, threatens to take us away from the shore. By the hidden wreaths around us of generational trauma and the scars of abuse and addiction, we are separated. Those waters can do a lot of separating between us. But Christ takes what separates us and casts us off on islands exiled from real, healthy, loving relations. That, excuse me. Christ, Christ takes us what separates us and what has casted us off from islands and exiled us, just like the Israelites. We are exiled from healthy, loving relationships and redemption. And what Christ does is he makes those waters of death those baptismal waters, an end to our sin and our brokenness. We are connected because of Christ. We are connected by mercy, which is needed by all of us, and bestowed on us by Christ calling us by name. These waters of baptism do not isolate us. They connect us to one another and to God because of Christ. For this is what happens when Christ acts taking on your sin. Naming sin is not enough. We know when we name somebody's sin, it just creates more separation and more division. It's necessary, but it can't be the last step. It will remain on your conscience if it's the last step. You need another word to follow the first. 
Herod tried to lock up the sin and silence the accusation, and it did not work. We even know Herod sinned 2,000 years ago, so that really didn't work for him. You need God to tell you he's for you. Jesus needed this too, after all. That's the last thing that happened in this baptism text. After being baptized and taking on the sin of the world, Jesus also needed to hear a sermon from the Father to say, you are my son, the beloved, with whom I am well, I'm well pleased. Pleased that you have taken on sin. Pleased that you will go to the cross. Pleased that you will bring mercy to creation, to Israel, and to us. So I have a hunch, looking at our in-person worship numbers, like I've said a few times, that we are feeling a little bit of isolation these days. That we are feeling a little bit overwhelmed and wondering how we're not going to be consumed in this last, this, this current wave of what we're going through. But the good news for us today is nothing can separate you from the, the Lord your God in Christ Jesus. On your little island, it is the water of our baptism, the water of Christ's baptism that unites us, that connects us, that makes us one even in the midst of separation. Because in those waters, Christ takes on death, resurrection, and sin. He went through the water and the fire, not us. He went through the water and the fire to bring us together, to connect us with the waters of his baptism for us. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs> Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He descended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Lord, in your mercy, the Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance, so we are bold to pray for the Church, the world, and all that God has made. By the Holy Spirit, you gather your Church and send it out in mission to share the good news of Jesus. Inspire your faithful people to be fervent in prayer and service, that all people know they are precious in God's sight. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You reveal your love and power through water and the Spirit. Guard rivers, seas, and all bodies of water from destruction and pollution. Secure access to clean water for all, and protect the land from drought and flood. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Establish among the nations the blessings of peace. Raise up leaders who will protect vulnerable people in their care. Strengthen advocates who risk reputation or retaliation for the sake of mercy and justice. Lord, in your mercy. You protect us through the fires and troubled waters of this life. Assure us that we will not be cut off from you by illness or despair, anxiety or pain, confusion or weakness. Comfort all who are in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort especially, please, those who are... We lift our prayers today, those serving in the armed forces and their families, all those during the time of trial and thanksgiving who are working to keep us safe, fed and encouraged, those making difficult decisions, essential workers who are facing burnout, those suffering pain from chronic conditions, the unemployed. We pray for the 800,000 people who have lost their lives to COVID and for their families. We pray for those who are undergoing cancer treatments, those who care for them. We feel... He, Excuse me. We pray for those who are suffering the loss of family this week. You created each of your saints for your glory. We give thanks for those you have called by name into your eternal embrace. Jim, Mario, Sue, Karen, Gary, Cliff. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We are joined in baptism to Christ and to one, <clears throat> one another. Bless those who are newly baptized and those who are preparing for baptism. Help us to be faithful in fellowship, worship, and evangelism, service, and justice. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We now open to other petitions, either silent or aloud. Hear our prayer. Since we have such great hope in your promises, O God, we lift these and all of our prayers to you in confidence and faith through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always, and also with you. Let us receive our morning offering. Oh, yes, share the peace, please. <laughs>
Merciful God, as grains of wheat scattered upon the hills were gathered together to become one bread, so let your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. For yours is the glory through Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord. Sharing our life, he lived among us to reveal your glory and love, that our darkness should give way to his own brilliant light. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray together the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to invite the two communion assistants to please come forward.
Please rise as you are able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, that you have fed us at your table with bread and wine, body and blood, the very life of Christ for us. Send your spirit with us now that we may set the captive free. Use your gifts to build one another up in everything. Reflect your glory revealed in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Receive the blessing of our Lord, God most high, God with us, God poured out on us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Lord.